Okay, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We really should do thanks, you know. Now, the original festival, first thing to remember is the Wampanoag people, I think that's what the name of the tribe was, that saved the lives of the Plymouth settlers uh, for Thanksgiving or two, and then got killed by them in the third or fourth one. This sort of sullied their good rep of that festival. So we should broaden it to think of all harvest time, post-harvest time festivals for having laid up enough, you know, acorns for the squirrel humans to, um, to survive the winter. And uh, so that's what it is, Thanksgiving. But actually we should be doing Thanksgiving every day because we are happy campers among the animals, and the, which include deities and angels, because they are also animals, that is to say they have animals, they have souls. They are soul-bearing, being selfless souls, don't forget, not the self-souls, but selfless souls in the sense of constantly changing, super subtle continuum of the spiritual genetic material that we individuals carry with us as we evolve from life to life, which we have been doing since beginningless time, and we will continue till endless time. And the question is, do you want to continue it out of love and compassion for all beings as a Buddha? Or do you want to continue it miserably running from pillar, pillar to post, feeling separate from a universe that doesn't care about you, that you are struggling strongly with? Which would you prefer? Now you will say, well, what's the reality of it? And this is the point. Who knows what the reality of it is? We don't really know. Uh, Buddha said he knew, and he discovered that it was a beginningless and endless process. And um, I don't know that he knew. I can't because I don't yet know that. But by inference, I think he probably had a better idea than I do. And therefore, I give thanks that there have been a Buddha in this universe, and there is such a thing as a Buddha. And since you're looking at endless time, endless existence, and the, you have to be resigned to that, there's no escape. I'll come later to the idea of nothing, that there's no escape into nothing, because luckily nothing is nothing. <laughs> luckily or unluckily, nothing is nothing. So you can't go there. So therefore, we we'll always keep on going. And since the world is infinite, what we should know is by inference, at least we cannot exclude the possibility that we could become infinite, given infinite time and infinite space. Why couldn't we become the infinite being, which is a Buddha by definition, which means a being that feels they are the same as all the other beings. So in a way, they feel they are every being. That's what you are when you're a Buddha. You don't feel I'm separate and I, I don't know if you're my friend or enemy or whatever, you know, usual way with the separated beings who wrongly absolutize their difference from, their, from others. And um, so the point is, given infinity, by inference, you cannot exclude that you could become infinite and you could self be infinite and therefore have nothing to fear from anybody. <laughs> Except, unfortunately, by being them, you fear for them, as them, they're being unhappy. That's all you can fear. And so because of that, you become, you are infinite love and compassion. Love meaning the will to the happiness of other, the, the beloved. And you don't want anybody, yourself or anyone, to be unhappy. Because you are all of them. All right? So logically, put it this way. While you can't fanatically assert that, for sure, unless you are that, you can by inference say you can't exclude that because in an infinite frame of reference, you can't be sure. So even though you feel separate and it seems unlikely that there could be something so radically different from the way you are, but you still can't refute it or exclude it. So given that, it becomes the wonderful Pascal's wager, version of that wager, plan on being that, try to be that, 
devote your life with the meaning of becoming like that. And the way to become going in that direction is identify with as many other people as you can think of, including this animal and that animal, and want them to be happy and therefore be loving toward them and then see how that feels. And then actually, I think you'll begin to feel that that feels better. The more you love them, the more you want them to be happy, the more you'll do things in the, to according to your ability that could make them a little happier anyway. 10% happier, as my friend Dan says, and even. And then you'll feel 10% happier because they'll be 10% nicer to you. Partly will be one of the reasons. And then, of course, include yourself as one of the beings, since you happen to be one, and then make yourself 10% happy and be loving toward yourself in that way. So then you'll begin to feel better. And then that will give you, in addition to the fact that you can't exclude it, so you're trying for the optimum, why not make that your meaning, that as you move in that direction, you begin to feel better. That even makes it better. And that gives you a little oomph from that side. And then, and then feel thanks to all the other beings. At least not one of them came and devoured you today. They didn't destroy you. Nobody did. Putin, the types, didn't drop a bomb on your head today. And sadly, he did on other people's heads. And that really was not good for him or them at all. So you wish for them to be happy and not to do that. And you have a, start having a nicer time, even as a human, who has a lot of worries, you know? We do as humans. So we give thanks, anyway, to the other beings for leaving us alone, for being nice to us. I'm wearing like a vest. I'm wearing, I have a blankie. I have a, because it might be a little chilly here. I have a, I have a jewel. Somebody made all these things. The cloth came from some substance that was woven by somebody, maybe with a machine, maybe by hand. This, if there's wool here, that was animal grew that, their hair, then they were sheared. I hope they weren't eaten at the same time, <laughs> but they were sheared. And then I got them, somebody wove the wool. I mean, we're surrounded by the kindness of other beings. And maybe they didn't do it thinking of me, but they just did it. Maybe they wanted to earn money for their children. There was some love in that. Maybe they were thinking, actually, by doing a good job, somebody would happily wear this if they were making something. We, just, we don't want to ascribe the worst. We don't know about the best, but let it go for that. And then we'll be more and more thankful. Thankful, thankful, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank means think. Thank and think. They must be related in English. Thinking is thanking. Thanking is thinking. Everything is thanksgiving because giving is where you give stuff to others so let them worry about it and let them enjoy it. You try to give one something they'll like even. That's really great generosity. Oh, we thank the universe for the generosity of all beings. Those beings who believe in an omnipotent God, they can be thankful if the God, that omnipotent God didn't send them anything bad just now. <laughs> Created them okay. They're not going to really be that happy about that idea because they're, that, then they're going to be mad that the independent God didn't give them everything right away. Give them infinity. Why not? If it's omnipotent, what's wrong with them? Him or her or it or whatever it is. So then that is going to be, not, that's what makes you not so nice. And actually God, according to Buddha anyway, according to the Buddhist sutras, the, the, the supposed omnipotent god Brahma in that culture at that time, his name was Brahma, which is a great sound, actually, Brahm, you know, has to do with growth and prosperity. It was a great being, that Brahma. But anyway, he was unhappy that people thought he was omnipotent. Because then he knew that when they didn't get what they wanted or when some horrible thing happened, which they really didn't want, subconsciously, even if not consciously, they blamed him because they thought he was omnipotent. So why didn't he, why didn't he do that to me? Why didn't he, why, do I, why is he making me into Job? You know, right? Subliminally, Job was like, oh no, I've created more pestilence and whatever, <laughs> more plague, more pestilence, more death to my relatives, you know. But subliminally, he must have been like, what? What did I do? Right? Why are you doing this? 
to me. Oh, you're having a bet with your friend the devil? That's not cool. I'm the victim? No thanks. Anyway, but thank you. Anyway, God is nice. God is great. God is cool. He doesn't want you to think he's that great, that's all, because he wants you to be great. You get it? So why don't you try that out? Okay? And relieve yourself of your subliminal resentment that the omnipotent one didn't do everything you wanted. <laughs> I know. My wife is so good. One time we were driving with a strong monotheist someplace at some event and zooming around looking for parking, didn't take an obvious one on the periphery, thought they'd find one open in the middle, and said, God always helps me find a good parking place. And my wife said, would you want God to be your parking attendant? It's valet parking from God? She said to him, he was a little, whoops, you know, but it's okay, we didn't spoil the day, you know. She has the skill of doing that I'm so thankful for. I'm thankful to all my children, they're so brilliant and nice. They're difficult sometimes, but they're great. And uh, everyone is. I'm, I'm really a problem, I'm sure, to them many times. And I'm thankful that they, uh, they're not, they haven't done me in yet. And, uh, and my grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and all my friends and their children and their great-grandchildren and grandchildren and their ancestors and parents and kind previous generations and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're thankful to all of them and, and thankful to the people now, thankful to our friends, thankful to the neutrals, thankful to the enemies for stirring us up, for getting us to not be like them, to, to also want them to be cured of whatever makes them so unpleasant to others because they somehow feel they didn't get what they wanted from others, the right attention, the right kindness, the right, we feel so sorry. You know, I wanted to be really mad with the worst president we've ever had <laughs> because he wasn't really the president was the thing. He was an imposter. So that made him a particularly bad one because he didn't try to figure out what it means to be everybody's president in a democracy. Because he wasn't really doing that. He just thought, ha ha, I, I, kid, I, I, can, I deceived him. I got to be president when I have no intention of being president. I just, I, I'm just trying to expand my business. Anyway, I used to be mad with him. Then I read his niece, who is a very good psychiatrist, analysis of his youth and the description of it. Minus a little grievance that she has about the way he treated her and her father. But still, she's a great shrink. And he had such an unhappy time, I felt truly compassionate for him. And I still do. And I want all the well best for him, which definitely would not be being president again. So I will certainly vote against it. And, uh, I, but I really, really wish him well. And I don't want him to go to jail. I want him to go into therapy. Even with his niece, you know, he could, you know, he'd be less paranoid about her in a way. Although he knows he has a grievance. But then he overcome that. She would prove that she's nice by being his therapist. I think he really needs therapy. And that's what he should be sentenced to if he ever gets in, convicted for his different crimes, which he has committed. So we have to be thankful for our enemies because they have challenged us to not hate them, to not be like them, to try to be the best we can be, and, uh, and that's really, really important. So Thanksgiving, please let's all give thanks. And there should be so much Thanksgiving that all the war should stop, and the Ukrainians should be given back their land, and then they should reassure any remaining sort of right-wing, deluded, national, extreme, extremist and nationalist Russians that they should then like, do things like make free zones, invite the Russians or pop, sponsor the Russians to join the EU after they've joined it and let the Russians develop a democracy because, tr trust me, Russians do not want a czar. Nobody does. I mean, they could have a, 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 like a, sh a czar show, like the British monarchy is the monarchy show. It's like a kind of Hollywood thing, but they, in, they don't have Hollywood in London. <laughs> the climate is too bad in England to have a Hollywood there. They do have studios. And the, the Buckingham Palace is a kind of studio. 
of a certain kind of show that inspires the people. And they don't, they don't have the power of life and death over the people, which is the supposed autocrat's fantasy of total power over others, you know, which was no longer possible on this planet. And uh, we give thanks that we can understand that. So don't think the Russians are somehow genetically need a czar, and that's why they have Putin. No, it's because KGB, which already wrecked the Soviet Union once, wanted to continue wrecking the Russian Federation, which they have now done through the person of Putin and his cronies. And this kind of life and death, we can kill people when we feel like it, thing, which the deluded science called political science thinks is the definition of a nation where some group has the power of life and death over the rest of the people. But nobody should have power of life and death over anybody else, is the point. And so we don't want murderers, and we don't want, uh, or we don't want a particular group of murderers to have control over the other potential murderers. <laughs> we don't want anybody murdering, so we would, we would punish murderers, catch, try to catch, prevent, and punish, but we wouldn't then murder them from the state, which shows murderers that if you can get away with it or if you have the license to do it, you can murder. That we shouldn't have anymore. We can't. It's no longer, as we understand the human being, we understand ourselves, we're modern, we have enough enlightenment, you know, because the Buddhas have been, are still working for us, those infinite beings, actually, but you don't have to believe that. But that's, I think, the reason, but you don't have to accept that. Point is, we have that. So we don't want all death sentences to be commuted in this country. I just saw earlier this morning on the net, some, I attracted my attention, I was trying to get, make, get somewhere on time. <laughs> and, and I saw that people who have to administer the death penalty, and then they have a weird thing where they do a rehearsal of the death penalty, and one employee has to go and be the victim and be manacled there, but then they don't kill them. But everybody else goes through the motions. But then the people who did that are supposed to have an NDA. They're not supposed to say what they think afterwards. But apparently those people, the people who then actually administer these death penalties, which are happening still around the country here and there in some states, they are against it once they do it. They don't think it's a good idea. They don't like it. Obviously the dead person doesn't like it, didn't like it when it happened to them. And so nobody likes it. So why do we do it? It's a wrong thing. It actually encourages murderers because it means if you can get away with it, you can murder because it is a state murder and we shouldn't do that. And I, we can give thanks that we can understand that and therefore we should abolish it just like we should abolish war now. We simply won't have wars. We won't give people weapons to kill each other in wars. There'll be some people maybe with the weapon to try to catch the individual murderer or the gang that thinks they can then now get away with it. So we, you know, we'll keep some defense thing, but no more of a war officially. If there's a real bitch over, okay, who owns Ukraine? Who, who owns the grain in that Ukraine? Who does it? Is it the Ukrainian nation or the Russian nation? Well, no, neither one actually. The farmer owns it. Who made it? Right? Oh, the, and the land, you know. And then who owns the land? Well, there's a modest, we'll have some kind of distribution, but not communist, because then nobody will take care of it. So someone will be responsible for it, and we'll figure it out, out rationally. We won't have a huge aggy business that ruins the land in order to make more money in a shorter time and then thinking they'll die and then they don't care about their grandchildren. That we won't have. We we'll have individuals being responsible who care about it and who don't deplete the land while they produce the food for the people, which in regenerative agriculture, we can have that. And a bigger company that does regenerative, okay, they can be like that. So we're gonna make it logical. We're gonna be, we are rational. We can be rational. We immediately will go and disqualify all judges. They will be impeached. They will be removed who cannot think rationally, who will do not know how to do a common inference with a you know, reason and, a re and, an, uh, and an example and a proof and an example. You know, and then everybody has to understand that. Irrational ones who make irrational things, who do some fake emotional thing, they want to attack this person or that, like the current grievance-dominated nerds on the so-called Supreme Court of the United States, they will have to be retrained. 
they will be relieved of duty because they are not being rational. So we need rational judges. Uh, that, that has to be a qualification for judgeship, not just election, nomination, and appointment by some political party members, but uh, tests of logic, of logical ability. And therefore, people can be trained in colleges. That should be the job to be rational. Everyone should have logic, not just physical ed in the core curriculum. They should have the ability to think rationally. And they can, and everyone is able to do that. All right? So we give thanks that we can understand all this stuff by inference. You know, <clears throat> I'm not enlightened. I, I am a little more than I was. I'm a little less stupid than I was, so we can call that moving toward enlightenment. So I'm somewhat enlightened, but I'm not a Buddha. I'm still stuck inside my skin mostly, except when I dream, and, and which I do, and everyone else does. So you're not always just self-centered around your skin. <laughs> Because in a dream you can go to other things, and you do. <clears throat> because uh, we are intelligent enough as human beings to realize that we can be more than whatever's stuck inside this skin. And so we can rehearse that in dreams. And if we, and anybody can train to be a lucid dreamer. I have had lucid dreams. I'm not able regularly to do it because I'm lazily didn't really persist in the training where you think about it every night, you write down whatever you remember in the morning in a journal, so you can sort of go look back to it in the, during the day or later, and then you would go re revisit it almost. You'd be lucidly, when you remember it, you can be lucid in the dream, because you're remembering the dream and then experiencing what you experienced in the dream, but you, but you don't have to not remember it. And that's a, that's a good training for being lucid. So that's why you write in the journal, and then every night you say, may I? keep my consciousness in the throat area, uh, in the nervous complex at the base of the spine, but in front of the spine, in the throat area where all great musicians have a lot of energy and inspiration. Birds, saxophone players, people like that, because they have a lot of, they have like a lotus, flowering, fabulous lotus in the throat chakra and the throat complex. And think of, I want to put my subtle, super subtle awareness in the throat as I sleep. And then I want to know I'm dreaming, and then I want to see my friend Joe in a dream, or I want to study with my late teacher in the dream, or my present teacher I want to visit in another country where they live, or he lives, or she lives, et cetera, et cetera. And just even though it may not happen, you just keep doing something like that when, you, when you're getting ready to go to sleep. OK? And, uh, and then you will, but I'm lazy and I don't do that, I get distracted. So I'm not good at it, but I have done it and everyone can do it. And then that really helps you become a bigger being because you realize that in the dream, you're making your environment as well as your experience. And you can try to be conscious of what your body's like in the dream. And oh, you can do a lot, learn a lot. And that increases your learning time, because after all, you sleep one third of your lifetime, approximately, right? Three times eight is 24, right? You should sleep at least eight hours, please, too. Don't try to sleep less than eight hours. Don't do that. Because you, and, and then make, but if you, if your um, alpha type wants to like be active and creative and use your lifetime meaningfully, you can then work during sleep by learning to lucidly dream, yeah? while your body is relaxed and it's receiving from the infinite energy of the universe, from the plenum of the clear light of the void, it's receiving nourishing energy and cells are renewing and it's all doing great. So anyway, that's, I want to be grateful, I want to be thankful. And now I want to be thankful to all the scientists because they are trying to be rational because they learn their mathematics and they learn their logic and their calculus and things and they and they observe nature and they experiment and note down the data and then they make theories about it and then they have a tradition of doing that and then they honor what other people invented and discovered and the theories that they have although they try to improve them they try to get more data and they try to better the observations and the theory and I want to be I'm so grateful for all the amazing things they have found and discovered However, in, out of gratitude to them, I want to point out to them that they reached a point where they're trapped in the dogma of materialism, 
even when, or for almost a century now, since 1926, it has been officially announced to them that they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> but they don't have to. That is to say, what they think they know is hypothesis. And what they decided to do is keep looking. That is, let their experience, their empirical data gathering, uh, which includes their own personal mental experience, overweigh their theories, even inherited theories, relativity, general theory, special theory, Einstein's gravitational things, whatever they are, they are not laws enforced by an absolute deity. Because there is no such being that's relevant to us. There may be absolute deities in some other world where there's no relative. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anybody who's in the relative world, such as us. Okay? Because absolute means opposite of relative, so therefore can't relate to us. All right? Because that makes it relative. You get that? That you can understand. You definitely can. And by inference, you can, that you can be certain of by inference, which leads to the openness of your experience. Inference doesn't shut down your experience by becoming a dogma. Inference rationally opens your experience to more experience, to more rich experience, to observing more carefully, to seeing more in detail. And that's what scientists are doing. And I'm so grateful to them. And I'm expressing my gratitude by criticizing them. I, I, for some reason, last night, after watching She-Hulk, because my, some of my children are here who want to introduce me to contemporary culture. <laughs> so I watched episodes of She-Hulk, The Lawyer. I loved it. I was a little irritated, but I liked it. And after that, somehow, they left it on Morgan Freeman narrating a sort of science pick documentary called Our Universe. Now, first of all, it doesn't belong to us. So the hour is wrong. Second, it's not a universe. Everything does not turn into one, our thing. It's a multiverse. It's everybody else's. And it's infinite. It's not the, uh, the unit, because we think of people think of one as a limited thing. It's not one, it's not two, you know? In a way, it is one in that there's no difference in infinity. And, and that's all the same thing, or something like that. But actually, there can be infinite infinities in infinity. There's no limit. So therefore, you can't say one infinity, in a way. But, you know, you could act like it's, you're one with it. When you become Buddha, you will be. You'll be infinitely infinite with infinite. But from the point of view of a, of a self-centered person who thinks in terms of one and versus two, then you can't say universe. You have to say multiverse. So, <clears throat> which is better. The, the luckily, we're getting that through the comic books. <laughs> We've reached the multiverse in the comic books of the Avengers and the and Dr. No, you know, and all of them, you know, the good guys and the bad guys. Thanos and Spider-Man, the Hulk, okay? So, but anyway, I'm thankful to those scientists, but I want you to be aware that you have to give up the dogmatism of materiality since you have to admit to yourself that you don't even know what matter is. In fact, your model of what matter is and the universe and the whole thing is based on 97% of something you don't know what it is. You're admitting, in a way, by your dark energy and dark matter. Because they're sort of influencing what you do see in a way that you can't explain if you only have what you do see. So there, is there these, there's this, all this energy that is sorting things out to keep your thing collected. But you don't really know because you, you haven't seen it and you don't know what it is. You're just going inferring from what you know that there's all this stuff that you don't know, which is good. That's getting you beyond the thing. So stop the materialism, all right? As a dogma, still you look, of course, at matter and you observe it and get more and more refined about it, of course. 
But then it gives you a little more humility about it, so you don't want to manipulate it quite so freely. You want to be more careful with it, more cautious about it. And then also you want to give full credence to what your own mind says to you. You want to be more aware of your inner universe, your inner multiverse, your own nature. And every one of you has to be trained in logic, you have to be trained in metaphysics, which is the philosophy of science. So you're really great philosophers. So you won't make a simple mistake by saying matter is all that there is, because you will know that you'll be linguistically more sophisticated. And mathematics is just a language. It's not the mind of God, you know. And many good God, mathematicians, gods were good mathematicians too, so they can also join in that. And then you, you take seriously the mind, because mind and matter is, are, are, a, are a duality. Don't, you don't say it's all mind either, like some spiritual people will want you to. They're just trying to correct your over-materialism. But then they get over mentalism or idealism. That's no good. Mind and matter are a linguistic duality. They give each other meaning and they're useful in the linguistic context and in mathematics, one plus two plus three plus four, right, etc. But they're not reality. Reality is more complicated and we have to be open to more subtle dimensions of it and more able to embrace cognitive dissonance, more tolerant of paradox and able to listen to ourselves and look into ourselves. And every single one of you scientists will be so much happier in your scientific life. You will do, you get so many more Nobel Prizes and so on. If you know how to master your own inner world, you become meditative yogis or yoginis. You learn to traverse the inner your multiverse and you develop, you really become much more respectful of the power of your own minds. And you can practically reach states of absolute, almost nihility, what seems like nothingness, but you will then even know that even those states are relational states, because you sort of enter the nothing experience out of the something, so it related from where you entered it. And therefore you never can get lost in it, and you never can become a nihilist. And then you can stop giving the human beings on this planet the false priestly indulgence and security that they can go to the null heaven of anesthesia, anesthetic eternity just by dying. And you will put a stop to many suicides that way of the precious human life form being who is depressed. And also you will help them encounter and overcome the crisis of meaning that leads to this massive epidemic of depression in the world. And you will realize, you will help beings realize there's no escape from life. So there is a commitment in all life to improve life, to make life better for others as well as self. And that is what we have to be happy and thankful for, that all human beings really inwardly know that. But when they become nihilistic because of a false dogmatism in science, science trying to be a priesthood, like high priests of nihility, you know, because of wanting to escape from that punishing God they were scared of from the previous religious fanatics, agreed. And we don't want to go back to them either. We don't want any fanatics. We want open-minded love fanatics, that's the only one, who are utterly open-minded and therefore utterly observant of the state of others' beings and lives, and therefore utterly committed to improving the quality of their lives, and utterly thankful that they are there sharing life with us and enriching our lives by being there and giving those thanks to them. That's our thanksgiving. All right? And, and I particularly i am hoping that the scientists will listen because this crisis of meaning is totally connected to the global heating crisis, overheating crisis, which we're in, where people are over-reckless about the materials of nature that they see, thinking that's all there is to play with, and that, that their life anyway ends meaninglessly in nothingness, 
but which is at least not scary once you go into it because it's anesthetic. It's not painful. It's not hell. It's just nothing. It's like anesthesia. And so, you know, it's like sleep. So, you know, it's, it's, we like sleep, so it's perfectly acceptable. And therefore, they can be reckless with the matter and reckless with the whole planet. And therefore, ironically, what we have done is we have created a death star, which is a layer of carbon and methane and other such things around us, surrounding and strangling ourselves with it, asphyxiating ourselves and all our fellow beings and all the other wonderful animals who are all on their route to being human too and going to have coffee with us. Even the lions and the tigers and the antelopes and the, even, the, even the viruses are really alive. Come on, this virus, bacteria, come on. Don't overdo that. So that you feel that it's okay to kill viruses. <laughs> All right? So happy Thanksgiving. And let's give that thanks in this way to ourselves, rationally speaking, to others. Everything is meaningful. And especially love is the meaning and thanks is the meaning and that cheers us up so no depression that's the best antidepressant is to know that we are the privileged not the whites or blacks or reds or yellows or browns or smoky colored or whatever it is we are the privileged because we have become human we have evolved to be a human where we really can identify with the other we have, we have this incredible imagination. So we are co-participating with the gods, with the angels, and even with the lesser animals in envisioning a mutually shared mental space, which is material. And it's more convenient to share it as matter that we share than just some sort of murky forms or something. All right? So that's it. Happy Thanksgiving. Ideally, we wouldn't be doing it by slaughtering 4 million or 40 million turkeys, which are animals too, and would rather be humans. It's not they're that attached to being turkeys, but the thing is, there would be other ways of making delicious Thanksgiving feasts and eating the soybeans and, the, and the, the, the food that we feed the turkeys, eating that straight, but making it into something just as delicious as the turkey. Because we definitely have the ability to do that without having to kill the turkeys. And then we wouldn't need so many turkeys, and more turkeys could be humans. We would develop a school for turkeys, how to be people to join us in the dinner. <laughs> we would. We, we could do that. We could think about that. AI could help us with that, right? Lots of love, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Dedicate the merit to giving thanks to all enlightened beings, infinite beings who are right with us, helping us learn to be more infinite and adopt the infinite lifestyle and get rid of the terminal lifestyle that we want to get rid of. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>